Hey, welcome back to Real Analysis. Uh, we're going to finish up our work in Chapter 1, Section 1.10, uh, talking about the very important notions of absolute value and distance in the real line. You remember from your work in calculus that talking about the distance between quantities is very, very important, right? Lots of things are based on things getting arbitrarily close, taking limits and so on. All of those notions are made rigorous through a careful study of what we mean by measuring distance along the real line. Distance we'll see at the end of the, le of the lecture is, is really just defined, uh, defined in terms of this notion of absolute value. Uh, I, I know that you know what absolute value means. Uh, it's a topic that's covered in elementary mathematics and high school mathematics. A lot of times there, uh, it's kind of presented as this notion of like stripping away a minus sign on a number. Uh, it's okay for, for practical purposes, but here we're gonna try to be a little bit more precise. So our first definition, 1.16 from the book, I'm gonna define the absolute value for any real number X. By when I say the absolute value of it, I'll use the usual notation. So just putting two vertical lines around X, it's a piecewise defined function. So the, the, the absolute value function's output depends on the sign of the input. Okay, so in particular, if the input of the function is greater than or equal to zero, if it's a positive number or zero, the absolute value of the number is just the number. If the input is a negative number, if it's a number strictly less than zero, its absolute value is its opposite. Okay, so, so, so sometimes that kind of hangs people up. You think, well, what do you mean? The absolute value is negative X. Negative X is a bad way to pronounce this because negative X makes you think that it's less than zero. The opposite of X is actually greater than zero if X is less than zero. All right, so this is just a way of saying uh, uh, what I mean by the absolute value of X. If X is a non-negative number, zero or positive, the absolute value of it is itself. If it's a negative number, the absolute value of it is its opposite. Nice. can look at a couple of examples while we're still looking at that definition. These are very familiar looking things. Yeah, the absolute value of five is five because five is greater than zero. The absolute value of, I'm going to say, I'm going to break my own rule here, negative eight is eight because negative eight is less than zero. Uh, absolute value is more complicated than just stripping away minus signs, right? Here I, I took a number like e minus pi. I'm writing the absolute value of e minus pi is pi minus e. Because e, you remember, the number that's approximately 2.7 is smaller than the number that's equal to pi, approximately 3.1. So e minus pi is less than zero. So its absolute value is its opposite. So it didn't strip away some negative sign. Cool. Okay, so that's our fundamental definition. So what I want to do in this video is march you through several, I, I've lost count, there's eight or nine of them, uh, so-called elementary properties of absolute value. Okay, so I've written out the proofs of these things so the video isn't so long and I'm talking a mile a minute, but just stop the video and absorb this stuff at your own pace. Pause, pause as much as you like. Okay, so my first fact, I'm just going to enumerate them with, with uh, uh, uppercase Roman numerals here. Like I say, there, there's some, some finite number of them. We'll see at the end how many properties we have. But in particular for the first one, uh, uh, I, and I just kind of broke these into bite-sized pieces, my first property is that if you take any real number x, it never exceeds its absolute value, all right? I'm gonna argue by cases, almost any proof or argument that I'm giving that involves absolute value will involve cases. Why? Well, because it's a piecewise defined function. How the absolute value behaves depends on its input's sign. So, so typically we, we treat these things one case at a time. So that's what I'm gonna do here. My first case is, well, suppose X is non-negative. Non-negative just means it's greater than or equal to zero. Well, in that case, by definition, the absolute value of X is itself. Uh, uh, so, so those two numbers are actually equal to each other. So in particular, one is less than or equal to the other. Good. If, the, if X is negative, if X is less than zero, well, then its opposite is greater than zero by order properties. And the absolute value of X is the opposite of X by definition of absolute value. So I'm just gonna string those inequalities together. If, if, I, if I kind of use some color to, to show you which one, I've already said X is less than zero. And although it's written in the opposite order, zero is less than the opposite of X. So that's that one. And we wrote over here that, that the absolute value of X is the opposite of X. So that's that equality. So if you stitch all those things together, I've actually proved more. Uh, X is strictly less than the absolute value of X, but in particular, it's less than or equal to it. 
And since every number is either greater than or equal to zero or less than zero, that's uh, those two proofs are, what's the fancy phrase from Math 240? They're mutually exclusive and exhaustive. That means one of those two cases has to hold and they never hold at the same time. Nice, right on. I'm gonna leave it as a little exercise for you to modify the above argument that it's also true that for any real number, its opposite never exceeds its absolute value. Okay, so I'm gonna let you work through the two cases. I'd pause the video and do it right now. It'll be fun and you will be successful. Cool, so there's our first two properties. A number or its opposite never exceed the absolute value of that number. What do we got in store here for property three? Property three relates absolute value and product. Uh, you take any two numbers, X and Y, pardon me. Sorry about that. I hope I didn't make you dizzy. I touched the wrong part of my screen. Take any two numbers, X and Y. The absolute value of the product is the product of the absolute values. It's a sort of poetic version of that statement. The absolute value of the product is the product of the absolute values. Cases going to rule out kind of a trivial thing. Uh, if either one of x or y is zero, uh, uh, then both sides of that e equality are equal to zero because zero times anything is zero and the absolute value of zero is zero. Okay, so, so, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that neither x nor y are zero. x is not zero and y is not zero. And then, you know, like I said, I'm going to look at cases. There's actually four of them. The two possible signs, if X and Y can't be zero, X is either positive or negative, and so is Y. So we have four cases. The first one I wanna look at is when they're both positive. Well, if they're both positive, order properties say so is their product. So the absolute value of X, Y, by definition of X, Y is just itself, it's a positive number. But X is the absolute value of X because X is positive, Y is the absolute value of Y because Y is positive. So, so in particular, our equation holds, okay? Second case, uh, uh, what if X is positive, but Y is negative? Okay, well, in that case, the product of X and Y is negative. Order properties show it. Positive times negative is negative, people say. So the absolute value of X, Y is its opposite because X, Y is less than zero. And I can move that opposite sign over onto the Y factor. And now again, X is positive, so it equals its absolute value. Y is negative, so the opposite of Y is the absolute value of Y. Cool, there's two more cases, the kind of symmetric case to the second one I just did where X is negative and Y is positive, I'm gonna leave it to you. Uh, uh, the case where they're both negative, I'm gonna leave that to you as well. All right, so pause the video and fill in the details right now. Nice. So the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute value. So what else we got here? What are we up to? This is the Roman numeral four. Uh, uh, what does this one say? Well, you take any real number X, the square of its absolute value is the square of the number. Okay, uh, how to prove that? Well, by order properties for any real number X, its square is never negative. If X is a real number, its square is greater than or equal to zero. So if we use the, the property three that we just proved, we can write, well, if, if X is squared is greater than or equal to zero, it equals its absolute value. Uh, uh, but x squared by definition is x times x. And then here is property three. If you want me, I mean, this is gonna look a little ugly when I'm done, I'm not happy with it, but I'm technically using property three right there. The absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. And well, that's just absolute value of x squared. Nice, these are going down smooth. What's the fifth one? A little bit more complicated of an argument this time. So the fifth one is you take any two real numbers, X and Y, okay, any two real numbers, X and Y, but I'm gonna assume that Y is not negative. And this one's an if and only if statement. The absolute value of X is less than or equal to Y if and only if X is between the opposite of Y and Y. This is extremely important. We will use this idea a lot. It's so important, it's gonna get a shiny red box drawn around it. Very important fact that a, a number in absolute value is less than or equal to a non-negative number if and only if that number is between the, uh, well, my, let me just use the names, minus y and y. Okay, so let's try to reason our way through this one. 
So uh, uh, just setting up the hypotheses here. Let's take a couple of real numbers and uh, X and Y, suppose Y is greater than or equal to zero. That's just the hypothesis. Okay, and then this is an if and only if proof. So I'm gonna start with the uh, assumption that uh, uh, I'm assuming that the absolute value of X is less than or equal to Y. So, so if that's the case, then by the first two properties here, right? In the, in the, in the first property, I'm just gonna write these things maybe in laser pointer. We said that um, X is less than or equal to its absolute value for any X. That was property one at the top of the lecture. So if that's true, but also X is less than or equal to Y, then I would get that X, uh, sorry, absolute value of X is less than or equal to Y, then X is less than or equal to Y by the transitivity of, of less than or equal. Nice. But, but property two said that the opposite of X is also less than or equal to its absolute value. So you stitch that together with this one and you get that, that inequality. So both X and its opposite are less than or equal to Y, okay? Uh, uh, may, maybe just for some variety. If I rewrite uh, uh, the opposite of X is less than or equal to Y, I can write that as, um, uh, so, sorry, uh, I highlighted in the wrong place. The opposite of X is less than or equal to Y, that's equivalent to minus the, the opposite of Y being less than or equal to X. Let's multiply both sides of that by negative one. So then just string those two things together. String those two things together. We've got X is less than or equal to Y, that one's written right here but we've also got that minus y is less than or equal to x. So you put those two things together and that's, that's our target. So that's half the proof. Okay, going the other way, uh, I think is actually a little bit easier. If we assume that uh, x is between minus y and y, well then we decouple those two inequalities and just write them separately. So x is uh, uh, less greater than or equal to the opposite of y and x is less than or equal to y. But, but again, if, if, if X is greater than or equal to the opposite of Y, multiply both sides by one and you can write that Y is greater than or equal to the opposite of X. Yeah, but I don't know which case it is, but whatever X is, it's either equal to its absolute value or uh, uh, it's, its opposite is equal to its absolute value, depending on whether X is non-negative or negative, right? So in either case, look what we're writing here. Uh, I'm writing that, um, X is uh, less than or equal, or sorry, greater than or equal to the opposite of Y. Uh, uh, so, um, and, and that also, um, yeah, uh, I just confused myself a little bit here. So X is either, the absolute value of X is either minus X or X, right? So if it's minus X, like this case, sorry, I just uh, I got a little wrapped around the axle. If, if the absolute value of X is minus X, then this inequality is telling me, <clears throat> software glitch, that the absolute value of X is less than or equal to Y. That's what I'm after, yeah? Uh, uh, but if it's, if it's the other one, that's where I got wrapped around. If X is less than or equal to Y, okay, well maybe uh, X is equal to its absolute value. So it's this one. So in either case, the absolute value of X is less than or equal to Y. Sorry, things were going swimmingly until that one, but that's, that's not bad. We were on number five. Okay, pause the video, take some air if you need to. I'm just gonna keep, keep plowing through to keep this video as short as I can. What's my sixth one? My Roman numerals are falling apart, but the sixth one says, if you take any number X, it's always between the opposite of its absolute value and its absolute value. This is really just applying five to the special case where Y is the absolute value of X, right? If Y is the absolute value of X, by definition, it's greater than or equal to zero. And this is actually an equality. So, so in particular, it's less than or equal to it. So just apply what we just proved. We get that, that my, the opposite of, that X is between the opposite of Y and Y, but remember what Y is, yeah? So, so six is just a special case of five. Okay, pause, let it sink in. Number seven, it's got a name, the triangle inequality. Extremely important, extremely important. Maybe I won't box it, but I'll just say that it's an important thing. It's got its name. It's got a name. Any any theorem that I name is sort of distinguished. So so what does it say? You take any two numbers, the absolute value of their sum never exceeds the sum of their absolute values. Why is it called the triangle inequality? Now, let me explain that in a little while. Let's try to see if we can prove it. So take your two numbers x and y, no conditions on them, and then let's use what we did above. 
twice, actually. So, so part six says that X is between the opposite of its absolute value uh, and, it, and the absolute value and the same for Y. Okay, so add those things. Add those inequalities together, uh, factor out the minus sign on the far left-hand side and you get that. So X plus Y is between the opposite of this number and that number. Well, then property five says that uh, uh, that's equivalent to the absolute value of X plus Y being less than or equal to that number. Cool. So these things are going smoothly because, well, I took some time to actually kind of arrange these in a very careful order. You know, if you just sort of threw all these results out on the table and tried to prove them in any old order, it could be a little bit rougher. But I, I kind of thought about it ahead of time and strategically organized these things. And by the way, I mean, I was taught this stuff. It's, it's not like I organized them. Somebody showed me a very nice order in which to organize these things. So I don't, I don't mean to take credit for something that's not my idea. Okay, continuing along, we're up to the eighth one here. So we've got at least eight of these things. Uh, did I skip? Yeah, no, the triangle inequality was number seven. We're up to number eight. Okay. So uh, what's this one? It's kind of technical. I'm just going to kind of, I don't know if I should even read it. But if you take any two numbers, the absolute value of the difference of their absolute values is never more than the absolute value of their difference. It's technical, uh, uh, but, but it's useful sometimes. All right, so this one, it, it doesn't really sort of uh, uh, ring warm in my heart, but, but we will definitely use it sometimes. Uh, I'm basically going to milk this out of the triangle inequality. So hypotheses. Grab a couple numbers, no conditions on them. And this is sort of a, a, the old analyst trick. Take a number X and subtract and add Y to it and you get X back, right? So then I can apply the triangle inequality across, well, this sum. So, so the, uh, uh, the absolute value of X by substitution is certainly the absolute value of X minus Y plus Y. The triangle inequality says that's never any more than the sum of those absolute values, okay? then just subtract absolute value of y from both sides of this thing and you arrive here. Cool. But I could recapitulate that argument. Instead of picking on x and writing it as it minus y plus y, I could write y is y minus x plus x. Recapitulate the argument, so that's what I mean by similarly, and I could derive that thing. But, but the absolute value of y minus x is the absolute value of x minus y because those numbers are opposites of each other. Numbers that are opposite each other by definition have the same absolute value, okay? So what do I get when I put all of that together? Well, I'm just gonna take this, sorry, I'm not putting it together yet. I'm gonna take this last one. In particular, I'm looking at the absolute value of y minus the absolute value of x is less than or equal to the absolute value of x minus y, and I'm gonna multiply both sides by minus one. So when I do that, it switches the order of subtraction, it changes the inequality direction, and I get a minus sign over here. So that's where I'm gonna pause. Now we're gonna put it all together. What am I putting all together? Uh, I'm putting all together the two uh, following things. I've got that absolute value of x minus y is less than or equal to Sorry, the absolute value of X minus the absolute value of Y is less than or equal to the absolute value of X minus Y. And I got this other one, which I'm not even gonna say out loud because I'm even annoying myself. But if I stitch them together, there's the blue one. There's the red one. So what do I know? I've got a number between us, the opposite of something and the something. So, so by five above, that exactly means the statement about absolute value. Sweet. Okay, hey, there's a ninth one. <laughs> there's a ninth one. Last one, I think. I shouldn't say that and get your hopes up. Uh, uh, but the ninth one says, take any two real numbers, no conditions on them. The absolute value of the difference is no more than the sum of the absolute values. This is also typically called the triangle inequality. In fact, seven, eight, nine are sort of all three, sort of, they're different versions of the triangle inequality. You can kind of deduce them from each other. Uh, here, just to be real quick about it, if you take these numbers, no conditions on them, apply the triangle inequality, just rewrite x minus y as x plus minus y. That's what we mean by subtraction. The triangle inequality says that that's no more than the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of minus y, but the absolute value of minus y and the absolute value of y are the same. 
Nice. All right. So now in kind of uh, intimidating bold red, uh, these properties are all very important. You know, so so I would kind of slow the video down a little bit, make sure you can digest these proofs. I'm not claiming that you need to kind of memorize every step, but but do maybe kind of, you know, read these proofs, study them a little bit, try to internalize them. And then if you can, kind of ask yourself, like, what were the sort of, what was the theme through these? I kept using the same ideas, you know, that the absolute value of a number and its opposite are the same. Uh, a, a couple of the algebraic properties, there, there was sort of a thread that I kept pulling on over and over in each one of those properties. So, so see if you can kind of organize that in your mind, because that, that's kind of what I mean by, you know, internalize these things, get used to them as tools. We're going to use them a lot. Okay, I haven't said anything about your text this time. Maybe, maybe you're wondering why. Your, your book states this theorem 1.17, Maybe somebody could tell me I'm wrong, but I couldn't find a proof of it in your book or in the exercises. So, so the author didn't even really remark that, that we should try to, to prove any of these things. But, but this is theorem 1.17. I'll just let you stop the video. This is getting a little bit long, but what I did is just wrote the Roman, Roman, uh, Roman numerals of the properties that I went through above that correspond to these four statements. So I did more than what's here. Uh, uh, the fourth statement, uh, uh, I wrote it in terms of a single absolute value. It's our property eight above. But I won't say much about, about this here, but in your book, Theorem 1.7 is some of these properties. And I just wrote my enumeration scheme over there on the right. So you can stop the video and I guess kind of go back and forth, or I don't know. Um, you'll have to kind of see if, if I enumerated these things correctly. So I'm going to end this. Uh, the title of the lecture was Absolute Value and Distance. I haven't said the word distance yet, so let me do it. Uh, the second uh, and final definition in the section, definition 1.18, is distance. Uh, and we're going to define the distance between two real numbers, x and y, to be the absolute value of their difference. It's very important that you kind of think about, I mean, you know geometrically what I mean by the distance between two numbers on a number line. But algebraically, to calculate, quote unquote, that distance, I use absolute value. The distance between uh, uh, x and y is the absolute value of their difference. And I'm going to end this video just by kind of displaying some, uh, or actually, pardon me, I, I got confused. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about one, one way to think about this distance idea. So uh, 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 just sort of brief side conversation. G give me a couple of real numbers, A and Epsilon. They're, they're sort of traditional letters, especially the Epsilon. Uh, suppose Epsilon's positive. And consider this set that at first glance has a ridiculously complicated name, N sub Epsilon of A. But I'm defining it, that's what I mean by the colon equals, to be those real numbers, uh, if I pronounce it in the language above, whose distance uh, 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 from A is less than Epsilon those real numbers whose absolute value of x minus a is less than epsilon. That is the numbers that are no more than epsilon away from a. And then using some properties, I'm going to leave it to you to kind of enumerate them. That absolute value statement could be rewritten uh, uh, because it's a strict inequality as a statement about something between minus epsilon and epsilon. And then add a to everything, order properties, justify that. And then I'm just rearranging instead of negative epsilon plus a, I'm writing it uh, in the other order. And then that last form, I can see uh, that that's an open interval. So it gives me a way of thinking about what this set n sub epsilon of a is. It's just the open interval centered at A. Why do I call it centered? Well, because A is the point that's right in the middle. And it's the set of points that are no more than epsilon units away from A. And I think geometrically that should make sense that if you start at A, you can go epsilon units to the right of it. That you'd be at A plus epsilon. The open parentheses are because I have strict inequalities. Or you could go epsilon units to the left of it. That is A minus epsilon. So this set, this n sub epsilon of a, it's really just the open interval between, um, uh, 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 well, a minus epsilon and a plus epsilon. So, so its name, I, I, maybe I should zoom so you can still see it. It's called the epsilon neighborhood of a. 
Okay, so it's an idea that we're gonna use a lot in the future here too. So that's what the N stands for, neighborhood. The epsilon neighborhood of A are the points that are within epsilon distance away from A. So if you're in my epsilon neighborhood, it means that the distance between me and you is no more than epsilon. Nice. Okay, now we're gonna end the book lists some properties of the distance function. I'm gonna to try to squeeze them all on one screen here. Uh, I'm gonna kind of just let you, uh, 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 I would read it in your book, not here in the video, but, but these are things that are kind of geometrically intuitive, right? If you're thinking about distance, first of all, that the distance between any two numbers is never negative. Remember the distance is defined in terms of absolute value. So that's absolutely clear algebraically. The absolute value of something by definition is never negative. Um, the only way the distance between two points is zero is if they are the same point. The absolute value of x minus y is zero if and only if x is y. It follows from the definition of absolute value. Uh, the distance from x to y is the distance from y to x. If that weren't true, then I, I, I don't want to play. That just means that the absolute value of x minus y and the absolute value of y minus x are the same. So these things over here on the right, I'm kind of giving little, little proofletts, mini proofs. Uh, the last one is called the triangle inequality. Why? Because it says, well, watch as I highlight, it says that the distance between X and Y is never any more than the distance between X and some third point Z plus the distance between Y and that third point Z. Um, and in fact, I don't, I don't like the way I wrote this. Uh, it, it follows from properties of absolute value. I'm, I'm gonna write it the other way, Z minus Y. So, so in other words, it's saying that the shortest distance between two points, X and Y, is the straight line distance between them. If you, if you go to any other point Z first and, and add those two distances together, then, then you're, you're gonna have a longer, or at least a, as much distance. So, so the triangle inequality is, is basically that familiar phrase, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Okay, I hope this was intuitive and, or I mean, fun for you uh, uh, and uh, thanks for listening.